I covered my first presidential election in 1988. Never since then have I experienced or did I expect to experience a presidential election like the one just passed. Or never have I ever gotten to cover Washington at a time when so much seemed to be at stake all at once. I have a, com a confession to make about my first election coverage in 1988. I was a low girl on a totem pole at the Washington Post. And so, because I was new to this, they would always send me out to cover the candidate most likely to lose. <laughs> it grew so bad that after a while, if I arrived at any candidate's events, they'd see me. <laughs> And it was like the angel of death <laughs> arriving to say, you know, give up all ye who enter here. <laughs> but as you might imagine, the toughest thing right now, even after all the years I've covered campaigns and all the politics I've covered and all the Congresses I've covered, the hardest thing is sorting through all the noise that you hear so you don't lose sight of the history that's being made. On any given day, it can be, and often is, far too tempting to be swallowed up in the rush of news. Thanks to Jon Stewart and Saturday Night Live, my pals, it has become downright entertaining to focus on the silliest aspect of what it takes to govern well and what it takes to run for president. It should be said, I love Jon Stewart, and I watch him whenever I can stay awake that long, but one of the things I like best about him is he knows he does not do what I do. In fact, I tell people all the time that the best way to get his jokes is to watch me first. My parents taught me never to take no for an answer. It came in handy, except to them, of course. <laughs> I always had to take it for an answer, but that's a different conversation. But this came in handy, this idea. When I, at my first newspaper job, I came to work one day and found a note left in my workspace. Um, the note said, nigger go home. Now here's the thing about me and the way I was raised. I wondered who that was for. Because <laughs> it couldn't be for me, because I didn't think of myself that way. This same attitude came in handy when the mayor of Baltimore, whom I covered in the 1980s, would bristle and scold me for asking him tough questions. He said once that I acted like a school teacher, as if there was something wrong with that idea. It came in handy when editors at various places I worked, whether it was the Washington Post or the New York Times, at different times tried to kick me to the curb. I knew I was better than that. And I knew no career worth having was a career not worth fighting for. All those old bosses of mine, most of them white guys, now take credit for my career. <laughs> That's kind of nice. I smile and let them do it. And it came in handy when the vice presidential candidates told me they were shocked, this is in 2004, shocked to tell me that they, that they didn't know that black women were suffering from disproportionately high rates of HIV infection. This was Dick Cheney and John Edwards. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> but then it also came in handy at that same debate when Dick Cheney told me he couldn't answer a question in the 30 seconds allotted, and I told him he had no choice. <laughs> my favorite part of my job, telling them no. And then it came in again handy in 2008, this year, when everyone was focused on Sarah Palin. Everybody, I got hundreds of questions, of suggested questions to ask Sarah Palin, and got almost none to ask Joe Biden, who after all was the other guy on the stage. The obsession with Sarah Palin was so great that they forgot that I had a different job to do, and I, my job was to remain focused on coming up with questions for both candidates, not so I could show off, but so that you could understand who were these people who wanted to be a heartbeat away from the presidency. I couldn't lose sight of what my role was just because other people were getting worked up about the politics of it all. I got into journalism because I thought on some level that I could change the world. You scratch a journalist, you'll usually find an idealist. I thought I could shed some light into dark corners. I thought I could break down a few barriers for myself and for other people. The barriers are still there. The corners are still dark sometimes. And I've discovered the world is often still resistant to change. Suffice to say, debates about war, peace, and terrorism and are good for politics, and they're good for the news business. But I dare say that the debates themselves are good for civil society as well. For me, that means deciding how to boil it all down every Friday night on Washington Week. 
our regular stable of reporters include folks who cover the White House, Congress, the Pentagon, State Department, the economy, politics, you name it. They got it covered. But lately, I've discovered that it's getting tougher and tougher to decide what the right questions are. As the news seems to get more urgent and international challenges increase and domestic challenges as well, the questions seem to get harder to answer. Being a journalist has taught me about many vital connections, like the difference between skepticism and cynicism, and how to recognize when it is a virtue to have a little bit of both. I'm a skeptic. I believe that there are always more questions to be asked. I'm not a cynic, which presumes that you already know the answers. Being a journalist has taught me that the best lessons are not necessarily learned from the people with the most power and the loftiest titles, but sometimes, you learn lessons just by keeping your ears open and writing it all down, talking to people who are not the usual suspects. And there's a little secret to this. The essence of the reporter's craft is to learn all you can about something that never previously interested you and then find a way to make it accessible to everyone who bothers to read or listen to you. That's what I do every night on the news hour. That's what I do every Friday on Washington Week. So forgive me if even after all this time as a journalist, I remain ever the optimist, ever certain that shining the light, the light of justice, the light of understanding into the world is hard and necessary and even ultimately satisfying. <laughs>